Here's um, radiation in the near infrared, big sunspots are having an impact, but when you go to the ultraviolet, you see the variations are quite different and they're dominated by the bright factor. So, it's important to remember that the sun's radiation doesn't all go up and down together, but bits of it go up and down in different ways depending on the wavelength, and the wavelength of the radiation is deposited in different layers in the system. So, where does this you know, bring the sun to climate change? Well, there are many causes of climate change. I'm sure everyone knows that. Solar variability is one of two primary natural forces, the other, of course, being volcanic eruptions, where aerosols from volcanoes um, are um, ejected into primarily the stratosphere and then impact climate. The primary, a primary forcing in terms of radiative forcing is the anthropogenic forcing from greenhouse gases which produce a positive radiative forcing and from tropospheric aerosols, tropospheric as opposed to stratospheric, because these reside in the troposphere and produce a cooling. And then we have things like land cover changes and we have internal oscillations of the climate system itself. Uh, for example, the El Nino Southern Oscillation. When there are big changes in the temperature, the surface temperature or the ocean temperature in the Pacific, this affects the global signal and I'll show you things like this. There's also the North Atlantic Oscillation. So the challenge for the sun and understanding the response of the climate system to the sun, you can see, is, is a big challenge because first of all we have to know the natural variability. Then we have to um, extract a small signal from the sun from what we think are bigger signals from anthropogenic change and land cover changes. And then we have to understand things like indirect effects from the stratosphere. So, how does the current uh, record of global surface temperature look? This is from the um, Cambridge, uh, the, um, the University of East Anglia Climate Research, Research Unit in England. It's, the white curve is the time series over the past two and a half decades of global surface temperature. So it's, it's the oceans and the land globally. And you can see it's gone up by a few tenths um, of a degree centigrade. There's a red curve, which I can't see very well, but I hope you can, that module or that, that reproduces part of the variability. And that red curve is simply the combined effects taken into a global scaling of the El Nino Southern Oscillation, which is this sloshing back and forth of warm to cold areas in the tropical um, Pacific and of volcanic influences. So when you put those two records together, you can reproduce a good part of the variance, maybe 25, 30% of the variance. And the values here, in, in a big ENSO, the global surface temperature has changed by about 0.2K. For the Pinatubo, Pinatubo volcano, it's about 0.3K. So these are the numbers of the natural variability. And you can see they're somewhat sporadic. Now, if you remove this red curve, from the white curve, in other words, move, remove the effects of ENSO and volcanic activity from the observations, you find firstly there's still decadal variability left and there's an upward trend. So the simplest explanation for that is to ask, well, what could be causing this? The upward trend, it's hard to get that from the ENSO or the volcanic activities, and I've shown here the sun's brightness changes um, converted now to a temperature change from the measurements that I showed you earlier. And you see they don't have an upward trend over this period either. They have an 11 year cycle. The upward trend that I'm showing here is the combined forcing by increasing greenhouse gases and cooling by tropospheric aerosols. So this combination of things, the sun, the anthropogenic gases, ENSO and volcanic activity together can, can explain a good part of the recent surface temperature change. Now, to reiterate that, I'm going to show you what I just showed you in another way. It's a, with a different data set. In this case, it's the GIS, the Goddard Institute for Space Studies Surface Temperature Record. And here I'm just showing you the, the global surface temperature, in this case in red, the representation from the components in white, and here are the components, ENSO, volcanic activity, sun, and anthropogenic grass gases. So this is at the surface, and you can see when there's an increase in solar activity, there's warming, when there's an increase in greenhouse gases, there's cooling, and when there's volcanic aerosol, sorry, there's warming, and with volcanic aerosols, they're cooling. Right, now, this is at the surface. You can do the same thing in the middle troposphere, because we have measurements of the temperature in the middle troposphere by the microwave sounding unit. 
Now, I'm sure some of you have heard the ongoing debate about trends in the troposphere versus surface, and that's why this line here, which is the anthropogenic component of the observations, you can see there's less trend here in the middle troposphere than the surface. That's why the trend is less. Now, it's not entirely clear whether this is an instrumental effect because of the satellites trending, or it represents a real less variability in the troposphere. But for the purposes of understanding the solar signal, you can see the solar signal is present here and detectable in the middle troposphere. It's actually somewhat larger, getting to be about 0.1k now. You can see the ENSO and the volcanic signals um, are, are definitely present and enhanced. Now, if we continue up into the lower stratosphere, so these three regions go from the surface to 20 kilometers, a mere 20 kilometers above the surface. Now you can see what's happening is we have a big signal by the solar cycle. This is now up to 0.4 Kelvin, and this is related to the changes in the ultraviolet radiation. The trend that you see just 20 kilometers above the surface is a cooling trend, and we believe that that's due to the increasing um, chlorofluorocarbons, which are changing the ozone. The ozone layer is depleting, and that's causing temperature change. Some people also believe that the greenhouse gases, although they warm the troposphere, they also cool the stratosphere and, in fact, the thermosphere. So this is a combination of two different anthropogenic gases. You can see now volcan volcanoes warm the stratosphere. At 20 kilometers, the volcanic aerosols produce warming, and the ENSO signal at this point has died out. So what I'm presenting to you here is a picture, a composite picture of the sources of climate change over from the surface to 20 kilometers. And this, we believe, is um, a reasonable estimate of the sun's role. Firstly, it's important to notice that you can detect it. This is the 11-year cycle, and, and I will show you some model simulations. The general circulation climate models, such as used for IPCC, do not, in general, predict a decadal response to the sun's variability. And that's because they assume that all of the forcing is thermal, it's conducted down into the deep ocean, and it doesn't reappear for decades, many decades. The fact that we see the signal here means that the processes are much more complicated than the models have in them at the moment. And I'll show you, they like, when I show you the simulations from the model, they likely involve dynamical modulation of the troposphere. So this, this result is fairly robust. You can see the solar signal is definitely there. And you can see it further in the ozone layer. So I mentioned the ozone layer because that's the, the gas that resides um, probably 20 kilometers above us. It absorbs UV radiation. So it would be one of the mechanisms for explaining those temperature results. 